This is Shooting Spaces with Rich Baum and Brian Berkowitz. Welcome to Shooting Spaces, a real estate photography podcast. This is Rich Baum. Oh, I was waiting again. for you to say Sacramento, I know, I know. California. Okay. Anyway, let's and start. And Brian again. Berkowitz from New York. No, let's, let's start not. it. Let's start <laughs> it. Okay, ready? On three. One, two, three. Hi, this is Rich with Rich Baum Photography, welcoming you to Shooting Spaces, a real estate photography podcast. How you doing? That's, Brian Berkowitz here from New York. Rich, you're, you're changing it up the intro and you're, uh, you're throwing me for a loop over after. here. Okay. Let's cool. do so one more time. On? How you doing? No, just keep it going, Rich. One okay, more time. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, hey, another podcast. How are you doing, Brian? How's it I am doing York? good. It's it's really busy. Things have picked up here in New York. We uh, Things are turning around. Everything is starting to reopen and I'm um, shooting, shooting a lot. So Yeah. It's, it's been exciting. a big change for us. Yeah. Yep. What about you? Same thing over there by you? Yeah, we're we're actually getting much busier. I'm I'm not quite where I was, uh, but the, I just want to tell people that might be listening to this a few years down the line. The COVID nineteen man, we've been really having a a big thing put upon us to uh, try and work with the um, the conditions. But uh, I'm doing very well. A lot of twilight shoots. Everything's been going really well. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, considering where we were a few months back, I think things have really picked up really, really nicely and we're on our way. It's been a mm -hmm. slow spring, early summer, if you want to call it that. And, uh, but you know, I think by hopefully the end of summer, things will be back in full swing. So yeah, it's exciting stuff. And I saw you, uh, you now have a tutorial available on 360s. That's pretty exciting stuff. Well, I've been working with uh, Cloud Pano and uh, trying to to do to help people with uh, understanding the whole process of 360 photography because with COVID nineteen, it's really been uh, brought to us in in uh, like news articles. Uh, the uh, the evening news is telling you all these people want to see virtual tours because we can't go out to our our um, listings and have uh, people see them. So uh, I just want to say Cloud Panel is a great way to add revenue to your business. And uh, it's, uh, you can do it with virtual tours. And I found Cloud Panel to be my choice for a great look while being fast and easy to navigate. And all of our listeners can get us started today for $1. Try Cloud Panel Plus, Pro Plus, add revenue to your business and continue doing what you love. Go to shootyspaces.net cloud panel slash cloud panel to start your one dollar trial today great so rich mm -hmm. let's get right into it because we have a great guest today and a lot to talk about so um i want to come in and introduce our guest for today barry grossman who's a design and architectural photographer and luxury real estate photographer based out of southern florida so barry why don't you uh say a quick hello to everyone introduce yourself and uh just plug your website and instagram in case people want to take a look at some of your work while we chat absolutely absolutely well first let me thank you gentlemen for 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 allowing me to participate. Um, big fans of both of your work for quite a, a long period of time. I'm Barry Grossman. I'm a New, York, a New Yorker, but I've been in South Florida for about 30 years in the Miami area, predominantly um, shooting interior design and architecture predominantly. But of course, there's a lot of overlap into the luxury real estate uh, market in terms of who your clients are. And so I kind of always was drawn to shooting interiors, uh, even when I was in film school and in photography school. So this kind of has been an, was an easy transition for me, truthfully. Uh, most of my clients have kind of an artistic quality and sensitivity. Um, and I think that's really part of the job description. You're not, you just don't need to be a good photographer, but you need to be understanding of who your clients are and what their specific needs are and of course when you're shooting real estate if you're shooting luxury real estate interiors for a design firm or an architectural firm there's certainly a lot of overlap there but there are distinct kind of strategies that you need to kind of think about um, in terms of a business and in terms of how you shoot cool so I know for me personally, I, I kind of got turned on to your work probably maybe two or three years ago when I saw your work in an ad in Architectural Digest for, I think, Stephen G. Interiors, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Am I correct mm -hmm. on that? Sure, and, sure. And I saw one of his ads and I saw that shot and I was like, 
I, I wonder who that photographer is. And luckily he puts your name in the credits. Um, so I was able to look you up and then I just saw, started following your work. And, you know, I've seen your, I don't know if I should call it progression because you've been doing this for 30 years, but maybe I should, but I've, you know, I've been following your work over the last couple of years and you never cease to amaze me. Your work is phenomenal. So I just want to invite everyone while we're chatting, if they can to definitely go and check out your portfolio and your website. What's your website address? Oh, I appreciate that. Um, the website is grossmanphoto.com and, uh, my Instagram is at Grossman Photo. That's G R O double S M A N P H O T O. Um, and thank you for the kind words. Uh, I mean, I'll go back to what you said for a second, and that is you, you were curious who the photographer were, was. And that's honestly the most important thing. And it's really become kind of the driving force creatively for me and also as a business person. And that is to be distinctive and to have a signature. And I think each one of us comes to our work every day um, as a professional photographer. And there's certainly so much overlap. We all have a, a lot of in common in terms of what feels balanced, what feels beautiful, what's effective. However, I think what, what I've always kind of strived for is when somebody opens up that magazine, there's an image in it and it feels like it's my picture. So I think that's really one of the most important things for me as a photographer, again, artist and business person, is that I have my own style and my own signature, and hopefully it's recognizable. Awesome. So let's, uh, let's I know you said you're a transplanted New Yorker, so let's uh, take it a couple of years back. You said you've been shooting about 30 years. How did you get into the business? What's your background like? Um, how did you make your way down south? That's a Great question. Great summary. question. Summary. I'll, I'll give you the 60 second version. Um, I met a girl uh, in film <laughs> school. We went to Syracuse University together um, and we were both film majors together and film, ma film as a major at that time was very, very heavy into film production and photographic production. Of course, this was all pre-digital even video was in its infancy and truthfully the quality wasn't good enough. And I came to my work as a director and cinematographer and a filmmaker, if you will, loving what they called the plastic arts back then and loving the purity of film and, and putting a beautiful, dramatic, hopefully provocative image on film, whether it's for stills or for motion pictures. And so for me, that was always about lighting. So, I did four years in Syracuse, came to South Florida because the gal I fell in love with, she was from South Florida and a good, uh, her, her uncle, who was also kind of a friend in the family slash uncle, if you will, we all have one of those, was actually a director in South Florida. He was a commercial director. And so we thought, well, rather than stick around in New York, which we did for about three months after graduating, let's try South Florida. And this is right on the heels of like the Miami Vice era, remember. And so when we first got down here, again, compressed story, I probably worked on 200 commercials, music videos, um, some of, most of which were awful, some of which were excellent and most of in the middle. Um, everything from PA to grip, to gaffer, to electrician, camera assistant, and then eventually working my way up to DP. And never I was a, props. You never did ne props never in our department because you're not good props. enough. That's sorry. No, I, I, we, we had experts to, to just, gather our, our props. <laughs> well, we you don't have experts. to be an expert. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the prop department, for the most part, in some of these music videos, <laughs> we don't need to get into that. But some of my independent films, I mean, I shot a couple of really cool movies and a flash forward in time a little bit. I ended up going back to New York to go to school and I ended up going to NYU kind of back and forth for about five years. Um, working towards my master's in cinematography. And so I got to work with a lot of, you know, great people there. Slightly elevated equipment list. Again, this is still all 16 millimeter, super 16 millimeter, very rarely, but occasionally 35 millimeter film. So I, I kind of come to my background uh, with that kind of really in my mind. And, and my, my first influences were, you know, classic Hollywood uh, German expressionism, cinematography, 
um, you know, Citizen Kane is, was everything to me. Greg Tolan, cinematographer. I don't, I don't, it can go on and on. But how does somebody who is in that world fall backwards into shooting interiors it was kind of an accident. Um, my wife's dad worked for an interior design firm. And um, he said, well, you know, my son-in-law is a photographer. Maybe he can shoot some projects for us. And like I said at the outset of our, our discussion tonight, you know, I could have hated it. They could have hated me. But instead, um, and that very first shoot was done with a 35 millimeter Nikon, my FE, um, I believe it was the FE2. And I had a 28 millimeter prime lens. I had a 50 millimeter prime lens. Um, I loved it. It just made sense to me. I was working with people that were into the styling. Speaking of props, they were setting the flowers on the table. And I, of course, it was so rudimentary back then. I was really, I had no business being there with these people. But I kind of meshed with them just from a personality perspective. They were artistic and they were into the whole process. Every shot took two hours to set up. And eventually, I'll flash forward into the story. I did about... Um, let's see, about 10 years shooting film, most of which was with four by five view camera. And so I eventually started to take on clients um, and really started to spread my wings, at least in, in, in terms of my region, you know, South Florida. And there were some heavy hitters. There were some amazing photographers that I looked up to and kind of, this is back in the day when there really weren't websites to look at. This was who's going to be on the cover of Florida Design Magazine, who's on the inside pages of Architectural Digest. And so I really started to build my business from that position. And as time went on, of course, digital started to become a little bit more acceptable. Um, still not quite there yet. From 1995 to the year 2000, I owned and co-owned and, and operated a digital service bureau. And my partner, owned an E6 lab and he used to process all of my film for years. And of course he had a built-in client base of photographers who wanted their work scanned. We had a drum scanner, we had big digital printers. So my, my knowledge of pre-press and digital really came from running that business for five years from 1995 to 2000. And at the same time, I was still going off and doing my photo shoots. I was still a pretty young guy. I was in my late twenties at the time, um, early thirties. And uh, basically, the handwriting was on the wall by the year 2000. My partner and I kind of amicably split. I knew that I, I needed to get out and shoot more. Um, who knew that I'd be spending so much time in front of the computer today? But um, that's really where I learned Photoshop. That's really where I learned about color and um, <clears throat> looking at um, color profiles and all that silly stuff that we take for granted today that was so important when you were scanning transparencies. Um, so in terms of how I really started to shoot more luxury real estate, it just was a matter of kind of the snowball effect and, and sticking with it. And in the year 2003, just a few years later, I shot with um, the, the phase one, the very first phase one system that was capable of doing two very important things. One, long exposures. And by long, I mean longer than a second, because back then, anything longer than a, maybe a, uh, an eighth of a second, you get a very noisy image. And so as we all know, and, and in that era, there was a lot of evening photography. You needed to have an exposure of two seconds, four seconds, 30 seconds, and not have ridiculous noise in it. But so the, this phase one system was able to deliver on essentially noise-free images with longer exposures. And it had the ability, because of the size of the sensor, to shoot wide angle, which is obviously supremely important when you're shooting interiors for either designers or real estate uh, agents. So once I was able to, to, to kind of shoot my work um, with that phase one system, again, that was 2002, 2003, um, I essentially had and since have not shot another frame of film. Uh, and I'll never forget, I went to my biggest, really three biggest, but one one big client. <clears throat> and I brought my, my my Mac, you know, the bubble, the iMac that used to have. And my we brought, the, I had a, the camera on loan and we shot something. And I had my four by five transparency, uh, excuse me, my four by five black and white Polaroid, which is how we used to proof our work. This is me holding a, a um, 
a magnifying glass. <laughs> uh, so you either proof it like this, or you can look at it on this antiquated screen. And I never forget my client, he saw the image pop up and he looked, and this is kind of a corporate guy because he worked for a big um, um, furniture showroom and a furniture designer showroom. They had, they're all over the country and they were a big client for many years. And he said three magic words to me, shoot it digital. And I basically, we put the camera away, put the film away, put the changing tent away, put the Polaroids away. And that was that. And once I had his seal of approval, I knew it would be pretty easy to start convincing other people that, hey, we can start shooting in digital. Cool stuff. I know you, you do shoot um, a bit of luxury real estate, although that's not, that's not predominantly most of your work now. Um, but was there ever a period where you were doing a bulk of real estate work, you know, from our point of view, I know I say our, I mean, where Rich and I come from, um, a lot of, we're all, we're both real estate photographers, um, I guess in our heart. And then, you, you know, some people who want to go further transition into design and architectural work right. where I am now. Um, and that's kind of the progression for a lot of people that want to go further or improve their work or, you know, make more money per job, whatever you want to call it. They transition from real estate. Did you ever go through that transition or you kind of, yeah. cause I know you said you started with your, your father-in-law or your uncle's. Yeah. My father-in-law was father -in place was that was an interior design designer. firm. So, you know, it's funny because yeah. I have a similar story. My first interior shoot ever in my life was for an interior designer also. Um, and it was horrible, but nevertheless, um, <laughs> that, you know, that, that trust kind of, me, it was horrible. I was, it was it, no, it was horrible. <laughs> I, I'll show you one day, Barry. Um, but <laughs> I got um, plenty of horrible. In fact, behind me are a bunch <laughs> of four by I have stacks and stacks and stacks of four by five transparencies, many of which were, are hideous, but go on. <laughs> well, so what that, what that shoot for the interior designer did though, was it piqued my interest and love yeah. for interior photography. And for me, the easiest, most cost effective and easiest transition to that was for real estate photography. So I'm yeah. curious as to your start in your transition. All right. Well, I'll, I'll answer that this way. I guess I'm lucky if you want to think of it in those terms that and as I explained, my background and introduction to shooting, this was really from shooting for designers. Um, and like you said, most people shooting interiors come through that real estate track, um, which is maybe better in a way because you, you're really learning how to be very efficient, create beautiful looks quickly. Whereas the truth is my work, the infancy of what I did, we were, we were used to spending 90 minutes, two hours to set up one picture because this was all underneath the cloak, shooting with a four by five camera, getting the lights set up. I used to work with a lot of tungsten lights as we call hot lights now, you know, continuous light sources. And I would acquire as many lights, every shape and size as I could over the years, which meant much of which I, I acquired when I was in the film industry. So in my equipment, room downstairs, I have probably 15 to 16 Mole Richardson units from the, the smallest ones to my largest one is actually a 5K, believe it or not. And yes, we used to travel around with these giant hulks and these things are heavy and they give off a lot of heat. Um, so yes, it's a different mindset, but now let's flash forward to the let's say the early 2000s where I was really starting to groove and kind of my business began to grow where I really was doing a combination of shooting for design firms and what I call the real estate industry because the real estate industry at least down here encompasses a number of different types of businesses design firms architects at the time home builders PR and advertising agencies um, not to mention, you know, real estate developers and, and the, 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 the premier properties, people that manage these real estate properties, uh, and they need images too. Everybody needs images it, within the framework of the real estate industry. So I, I see there's a lot of overlap. And I would say from 2003, really, really until today, but, but maybe more so at the beginning, I, I, I was doing more work within kind of that umbrella under that umbrella for the real estate industry. And so sure, I, I, even to this day, I still have a few clients that are real estate brands. And, and usually these are like management companies that have got high rises or mid rises or multifamily units that need, you know, generic, handsome, clean, what we would all call professional real estate shots. 
Um, and sometimes they're more, um, what's the right word? So sometimes they're, 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 the expectations are elevated and sometimes the expectations of your photography aren't quite as elevated. And so I think, and that might be a separate thing we could talk about because that's actually something that's really important and that is the expectations we have of our own work and how that can influence who our clients are, how that can influence the quality of our portfolio. But just to talk about the transition, I think for a handful of years, it really was a mixed bag of clients. And I think for sure, um, how you shoot for those clients differs slightly. There certainly is a through line. And if you shoot 20 pictures, um, 10 of them are going to be amazing for client A, 10 of them are going to be amazing for client B. And there's going to be some overlap between those two clients. And I have, um, over the course of my career, and, and again, recent career, sh shot assignments for more than one client at a time. And that's actually something that's really important that, that we, you know, in, in uh, people listening to this podcast, I hope, kind of get. And that is when you're, sh when you're creating images, um, I, I think strategically you should have in the back of your mind um, not just client A or client number one, but potentially who else might be interested in your work. And when you start to think about those other potential licensing opportunities, I hope that raises your expectation level of your work. That lets you take a little bit more time to maybe get a few types of images that maybe a design firm might want. Um, I shot um, and, and shoot commercial interiors as well. And there, there are wonderful opportunities there for licensing. So you're shooting for client A, who might be the designer or the architect, and now you've got their vendors. You've got the chair manufacturer, you've got the flooring people, mm -hmm. you've got the lighting people, and there's a lot of commerce there if you're strategic. Good. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because we're big proponents of that. And um, I think it kind of falls a little short on the real estate industry compared to, yeah. you know, interior design and architectural, but, you know, Rich and I put on a webinar with um, a gentleman named Adam Taylor out in California a couple months back, um, just solely on this, who, who basically he's an interior design photographer and he has a complete revenue stream licensing out his images to other manufacturers. So right. yeah, what you're saying. And, and one of the things he said, which is important too, which, which to just to reiterate what you just said is when you're on a shoot, think about all those other vendors and those potentials, because there's a lot of money there and you can go out and you can, um, you know, you can license them out. I, I just licensed, I shot a commercial kitchen two months ago for a cooking school. And I just licensed out six images to the lighting company, the lighting manufacturer, completely right. unexpected but by just, you know, a couple of Instagram tags and they found me and, um, you know, and I licensed some images out. So yeah, definitely think, think of that when you're going into a shoot because it changes your whole mindset. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we all know how hard it can be when you, when you've got to grind at a location and it, it's, it's real easy for, you know, the three of us to sit back and say, oh, you know, we need to do this. You can do that. And there's so many amazing opportunities, but you know, you've got to grind for 90 minutes and then get in your car and drive to the next location. I think that's honestly a, you know, that's one of the kind of negatives for me shooting quote unquote real estate jobs is really, um, and, and one of the, main reasons I've really over the course of my, my shooting career strived to try to keep a certain look to my work. So it would hopefully attract clients that would say, Hey, Barry, slow down, create beautiful work for us. Cause this is what we expect. Um, it's hard though, when you've got it and I've got, believe me, I, we, we all have these clients where you've got to bang out 20 pictures quick and they better look good. And, and, and I always say this to my, you know, people that I'm working with, either my assistant or people that I've kind of um, worked with at webinars or at workshops. And that is in six weeks, six months, a couple of years, nobody's going to know how quick you were during a photo shoot. And conversely, nobody's going to know that you took an hour to set something up or two hours to set something up at, at, at one point, And that point generally is when you deliver the photo, that photo needs to live on its own period. That nobody cares about the blood, sweat, and tears, or lack thereof. So, 
you need to be able to be strategic, you know, using some of, you know, and I've watched quite a few of Rich Baum's videos, by the way, love them. You need to use Rich's techniques to create beautiful looks quickly and efficiently. Um, and because listen, you can't defend your work and you, and because the work has to speak for itself. Not only that, you know, the work ends up speaking for you, doesn't it? And so I'm working with a couple of photographers over these past few months. Um, and some of these guys have reached out to me and said, Barry, um, uh, I want to get better interiors shoots. I want better clients. How do I do that? Um, or how do I get higher end uh, real estate shoots? How do I do that? I, I'm shooting for these two, three hundred thousand dollar homes. I want the two, three million dollar homes, whatever the case may be. I'm just throwing numbers out. Um, how do you do that? And the simple answer, and it's not that simple, is it's twofold. One, shoot great work. That's really the most important thing because at the end of the day, like I said, it's the work that speaks for you. It's the work that speaks for itself. So the work needs to be strong. And, and the second, and maybe this is almost as important, represent your brand the way you want to be perceived. And that's sometimes hard for us as photographers um, because we think of ourselves and we see our work in a certain way. And it may not be the way others perceive us. I know that I can tell you that firsthand. Um, but think very hard about the work that you're projecting, whether it's on your Instagram or your website, or if you're sending up promotional pieces to people, um, what pieces are representing you? And I honestly have given photographers this advice, and that is, I don't want to say less is more because I don't believe in that, but I will say, don't be afraid to edit yourself. And if you have 50 photos on your website, maybe you only need 25 photos on your website that are exceptional. Um, and again, it's very difficult to make that kind of judgment on our work. I struggle with it as well. And that's why I've reached out to professionals basically every year to say, hey, let's do a portfolio review. What do you think? What do you like? What needs to change? But again, the simple point is, if you want to elevate your clients, you need to elevate your work and you also need to present yourself in such a way, I think, that they're going to say, oh, this is who he is or she. This is what so-and-so photography is all about. You don't want to distract them and put things on your site that are not going to get you those job opportunities. You know, Barry, I got to tell you, um, how wonderful everything you're saying is, especially to me in my, my place. I Obviously, I'm still doing entrenched in real estate photography and the fast and the furious be, because, I mean, a lot of agents, they don't care about the quality. They care about how what their time is. Yeah. But you've got to balance it out because we've got to make a living. So yeah. I want to tell you, from one of the things that you've said, and, and if people have listened to us, and if they were at the PFRE conference in Vegas last year, they'll know it's interesting because you weren't there but you were exactly right on key with shoot what you want to be shooting. Promote what you want to be doing, not what you're doing now, but be, be true to yourself and to your business. Um, you know, keep your real estate agents happy and whatever they need. But don't forget, this is about a journey. This is a quest. This is, this is a career, not a daily grind of what you're yeah. doing now. You could be working at McDonald's and making more money, as some people say. I hope not. But a lot of people <laughs> say, the, the, it took me 12 hours right. to edit this house. And yeah. I've been shooting a month. It took me 12 hours to shoot this house. And it took me 12 hours to edit it. I'm making 62 cents an hour. But... It's not about that. And then I think it really is all three of us are, are a little more seasoned and we've been around and we understand it's not what you're doing this moment. It's where you want to go. Yeah. So let me ask you, and one thing I've got to say, when I look at your website, and again, anybody out there, if you haven't checked out, do so. And if you're not watching this, when you get home, check out the Barry Grossman in uh, his website because he, you have so many wonderful things. And one thing that came up now, you have, you have great portraits, by the way. I loved your, 
portraits because, and you can translate this to real estate agent portraits. Now, exactly. these are not with a background and, and can lights and three point lighting with a hair light. These are natural on location lightings dealing with, I think they're all black and white, but dealing with depth of field, dealing with in your own environment, things like that. So that's one really great thing I emphasize for people to check out. Look at this, Barry's website for anything. Forget about, forget about great, great um, architectural photography, but look at it as, as even the portraits, but look at you as an overall for your photography skills. But I think that you can look at things differently. And one thing I've noticed, and especially looking at your images, your compositions, and this is something that's dear to my heart because last year, are you are you familiar with Tony Colangelo? You know uh, Tony? Only because Brian, I mean, in all full full disclosure, Brian yeah. introduced me to him. I, I think I, I had known the name for many years. He's he's been around forever, but truthfully, was not that familiar with his work or his his tutorials on on mm -hmm. composition until so Brian introduced them to me. Well, you Tony had me, and it could be anybody that gets you thinking about something to think about and what to do. Mm -hmm. And one is composition, but one is relating to what you just said before I was speaking was people should look at, take a moment and photograph something that is different than real estate. It could literally take you one minute to change up a lens, turn it vertically because mm -hmm. real estate's all horizontal. Do a shoot for yourself. Do a shoot for a, uh, an agent told me years ago, they got really pissed at me. She said, I have a, there's a $12,000 stove there, a wolf stove, and you did not get a specific shot featuring that. And I said, no. And I learned that if I ever mm -hmm. get a really nice stove or something, take a picture of that and you can use it for possible licensing opportunities for wolf, for other companies. And yeah. I just think it's so refreshing, but can you speak upon composition where it's so important to every aspect and so many times when we're doing real estate photography we don't remember it but i know personally i have really thought about putting it in my mind that i'm going to work on composition and it's helped me in, in 2020 especially because i think about composition all the time okay the most, the most important thing is how we compose our images period it can be an amazing room. It can have beautiful light. If the frame is incorrect, if the camera's tilted down, if the camera's panned right, if the camera's in the wrong spot, well, we've lost it, haven't we? Composition, to me, is the most important part of our work. Next is quality of light. Next is subject matter. Um, and all those things need to be harmonious, don't they? Um, I mean, I come to my compositional kind of strategy going back to my film days and so i also have many years as a fine art uh um fine artist drawing and painting i did a lot of that in school i did a lot of studio arts in school so i i wish i can name a handful of photographers who inspired me and f from whom i learned composition but i'm not a great name dropper number one and number two it's not honest honestly the actuality for, for me i learned composition from doing drawing and painting and watching old films. That's really what, where I learned how to shoot, truthfully. Um, so my style and my compositional style has transformed some over the years. And I think some of that has to do with subject matter and also what my clients, you know, wanted in terms of style. I remember in the early 2000s, it was about foregrounding things. So there was the palm tree in the foreground or shooting through something, shooting through the open doors. There was a lot of depth being created with foreground elements to background elements. Remember back in the days of film, you're shooting at an F32 or an F64, F, or more than likely an F32 or 45, truthfully. Um, and that very, very small aperture gave you incredible depth of field. And so you really could take advantage of creating a foreground to background kind of relationship in terms of composition. Transition to today where things are a lot more open, things are a lot more clean because what you're shooting for the most part is more more modern, more kind of bright. Uh, and I'm composing things a little bit differently these days. I'm shooting a lot more symmetry. If you look at my work, I'm getting a lot more symmetrical. I, I think the important takeaway and what my thoughts are on composition are um, 
and maybe this is my film background, I think every photograph needs to have a star in it. There needs to be a star of the show, so to speak. And that star can be a window with a view. That star can be a, a, a painting on the wall. That's, that star can be beautiful accessories on a coffee table. Um, now, of course, there is also, you know, supporting actors in this. And so the quality of light, <laughs> you know, how, the, how things, how that beautiful accessory on the coffee table is being backlit. You know, that's a supporting actor making our star look amazing. But you don't want to have too many stars in your picture. You want to have one main star and then supporting elements that bring it to life and put it in context. And so I think any real estate photographer, if I can kind of put this in more tangible terms, I think very kind of a, a very kind of um, I don't want to say flaw because that's unfair, but something that makes an image feel like a real estate shot and maybe not even a, a bad real estate shot, but you know, an average real estate shot is there is a lack of attention to one element within a picture. I think strategically the next time our, you know, we go out and do a real estate shoot, ask yourself, what's the most important thing in the room? And if you don't know, well, use your intuition. And if you're with your client, ask your client. Um, of course, if I have the benefit, or if, if you're out and you're shooting for, for a designer, you know, like Brian just said, or, or, or like Risha said, he didn't know that that Wolf oven was $15,000, whatever the case may be, you know, have that dialogue so th that you know that, oh, well, that's a very important thing to, to focus on. So when it comes to shooting kind of in general interior photographs for, uh, for real estate, don't, don't just say, you know, wall, wall right, wall left, window, and who cares what's in the middle, as long as I get left to right. <laughs> and listen, I fall into that trap, too. We, we, we do fall into our habits, some of which are, are redundancy in terms of our portfolio. We don't really want that. So ask yourself, retrain your eye and say, what's the most important thing in the room? That's the first, the first strategy. The second strategy I would suggest is how do I frame it? How do I compose it? Composition. How do I compose this image to make that important element it m most important, most effective, most beautiful? And f for me, it's usually going to be um, a grouping of furniture with a view, artwork, a lighting fixture. It could be a staircase. Or if you're shooting exteriors, it could be the front door. I mean, I know as a real estate shooter, we have to get the whole house so so often. Well, get your house shot, and then don't be afraid to, to step forward 15, 20 feet and go left and get your detail of the door so you can really appreciate it and maybe put a little bit of lighting on it. So composition to me is about being strategic, but there's there are also some kind of embedded kind of foundational truths to composition. You know, I did a, a, a workshop a couple of years ago when we were setting up a, a pretty symmetrical picture. And one of my photographer attendees said, does it bother you that that one chair is whatever, two inches further to the right than the, than the other chair? And the answer gener in general terms is yes, that would bother me. <laughs> However, the point I'm trying to make right now is you're not looking for perfection. You're looking for balance. And sometimes balance in a composition isn't about everything being perfect. Um, but as interior shooters, as architectural shooters, I'd like to think I'm a fairly technical photographer, and I think we have to be. You know, watching Rich's videos, um, you need to be technical. You just can't be an artist there and get quality images. Um, so making sure your walls are straight, <laughs> make sure your horizontals are not distracting. Um, so I hope that answered the question about composition because, you know, the, it, that's a really big one. That's, a, that's the most important thing in photography to me. And your pictures on your website, uh, absolutely. I'm just now looking at them as we're talking. They are the best. Barry, you're, you're really, and I rarely use the word master because I don't know if we ever master what we do, but you really True. do. But, uh, I well, think we, we're learning every day for sure. And, and I will say this, my look that I've achieved is really a combination of being strategic when I frame and being strategic in terms of how I light. And I think, you know, these days there's a, there's a, there's a, um, things are trending more towards naturalism. I know Brian and I have spoken at length over the past 
six weeks off and on about creating beautiful looks with natural light and some of the software packages that are available these days where you don't need to use supplemental lighting. And for the record, I work similarly to Rich. I, I work with a lot of strobes, but um, I mean, I've also become very, very efficient as well. But part of the look that you're talking about, Rich, is really about how I sculpt my lighting to create kind of that, you know, three-dimensional quality to some of the stuff. But listen, we're, we, we, we get better every day and, and we grow tired of stuff that we've seen over and over and over and over. And if I had my wish, I'd have, I've been shooting for the past three months and have a whole bunch of new photos to put up there. But you know, be proud of your work, even your past work. I'll, 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 I'll be quiet after that. Because Remember that, I Brian. <laughs> be proud of your work. And I'm telling you, some I had somebody who was going you know, to represent me, which is, and, and if anybody's curious, do I have a rep? The answer is no. But I had a, a New York-based rep who was in discussions with me about repping me. And she was very complimentary, blah, blah, blah. We're talking. And then she says, well, you have a lot of palm trees. Do you have any shots? Or, don't you have any homes? And I said, I said, listen, I'm not going to apologize for my portfolio to you <laughs> because we can't, you know, we, we need to be um, self-critical, but we also realize that a portfolio is, takes time. And like you said, Rich, you can't, you can't go from shooting a couple of months to have amassed a huge portfolio. It literally takes years and years. And trust me, I did so much grinding as a young photographer and did so many shoots for free or for near free. Or, or they cost me money because film and processing cost a lot of money back in the day, especially four by five, um, as a way to get my foot in the door for companies uh, shooting from like upstart magazines. Hey, we know this young photographer, he's going to shoot for nothing, but it's going to be really great for you, Barry. You got to go out. And so I said, okay. So I got my foot in the door where really a 24, 25 year old shouldn't have been truthfully, but I got my foot in the door with these established companies shooting a vignette for them or whatever. And hopefully they liked it and hopefully they hire me next week or next month. And that's what you have to do. Cool stuff. All right. I'm going to stop for a minute and just uh, mention one of our sponsors, HD Photo Hub. HD Photo Hub is the real estate photographer's platform for fast and efficient business workflows. HD Photo Hub automates the boring stuff by integrating with Google Calendar, Dropbox, QuickBooks, YouTube, Vimeo, MailChimp, and more. So you have more time to focus on the fun stuff. If you haven't seen them lately, take a look today at hdphotohub.com. That's hdphotohub.com. And... Going back to what you just said, Barry, you know, you're talking about shooting for free and, you know, Rich and I both have spoken about this um, in the hundred plus episodes we've done and um, I've done it and that's helped catapult, I don't want to say catapult, but it's helped kickstart my career. And I know Rich, you've said you've done it. Um, and I think I, I personally agree. I know there are people that say never work for free. You, you know, you're, you're kind of diminishing your value, but there's twofold. First off, obviously when you're starting and you have no body of work, you need to get a body of work. But in the same sense, you're always trying to improve your portfolio. You know, and a perfect example is today. What I did actually is I shot last week for a real estate agent on a beautiful, brand new, beautiful house staged by a designer. The whole thing was gorgeous. And when I shot it last week for real estate, they gave me about an hour and a half to shoot the entire house for real estate. So you're in and out quick going. And I said to the homeowner when we were le leaving, your house is, it's about 15 minutes from me. Your house is beautiful. Can I come back sometime and just spend a couple hours and just shoot for my portfolio here? And he said, by all means, come and do it. And yeah. that's literally, I, I was talking to you, Barry, before we started recording an hour ago. I was on the way home while we were chatting from that shoot. I was there for mm -hmm. a couple hours and awesome. I just, you know, I got four or five shots just for my own portfolio. And I'm going to give them to the real estate agent because I said, you know, you guys are being nice to me. You're, you're letting me into your house. If this will help your, you know, the agent you hired market the property better, let her, let her have it. it. You know, that's not going to bother me. That, that, that license is not going to make it make or break or make a difference to me for any sake. But, you know, out of the four or five shots that I shot, there's one shot that I, that I really like that I think once I edit it is going to be portfolio worthy and stuff like that. Um, not necessarily shooting for a client for free, but even going out there and making these offers like this just to build your body of work will help, yeah. help kickstart your career. Well, I 100% agree. And if you're a young photographer, you need a portfolio, period. And you, you've got to grind and find those opportunities. I, I joined several um, 
associations, Builders Association of South Florida, the uh, American so- Society of Interior Designers. I networked. I did this. I did that. I, I was one of the photographers walking around at the parties, you know, grabbing the shots as the designers had their cocktails and received their awards. Uh, there should be nothing, and maybe this goes back to my my work ethic because of my film background. Um, trust me, I've done every everything that you can do on a set for being the highest paid guy on the set to literally the zero paid. Didn't do props though. Didn't do props. Didn't do props. I never did props. <laughs> Most of the props guys were very artsy and, and, and kind of off, you know, a little twisted as from my recollection, very artsy people. But um, so yeah, d- nothing should be beneath you, but I get what you're talking about. It's hard to, to establish oneself in business when your fee is zero dollars. So you just need to be able to tell yourself, look, um, even if you're, you you need to build a portfolio and you need to also be good at communicating with who, with your clients. And so you, if you you should have the confidence in your work, maybe you call up a, a real estate agency and say, Hey, listen, this is what I'm doing. I want to prove myself. Can I shoot a job for you free of charge? The first one. You, this way, you're you're putting limits on on your freebies. I mean, for sure, you want to do that. Uh, and this is how you build your portfolio. And it's it's a, there's a lot of give and take. There's a lot of negotiating. And there's a, uh, but nothing is forever. I mean, listen, we're in a, we're all in kind of a tough spot right now. And I'm having to make you know concessions on my fee structure with a lot of people right now. And I basically have given people you know, year, year 2020 pricing, you know, hopefully it's not going to be 2021 pricing, but it's 2020 pricing. And I think I've always run my business, um, being sensitive to my clients wants and needs, maybe to a fault, maybe to a fault, because I've always, I want to give them, if they're expecting 10 pictures, I want to give them 12, you know, I, if they're expecting this much, I want to give them this much. Um, back in my film days, um, when I was gaffing for somebody, and gaffer for somebody who was in charge of the lighting and the reflectors and stuff, and I was working for another cinematographer, and um, he said, "I get get a uh, get a four bar whatever he was asking for." And, I, and so me and my grips brought three because he goes, "I love Barry. You ask for one, you get three. And sure enough, we needed more than one. So I, it's just kind of who I am. I want to. Um, give people more because I expect more from myself. I'm not sure if I f- fell off the edge of this question or not, but um, I, uh, so maybe you should ask another one. <laughs> well, well, let me ask you, because this was, you know, a transition that I wanted to get to today. Um, and you spoke about portfolio building, and I think that's maybe the first step, but mm-hmm. uh, I do want to focus a little bit on luxury real estate and that side of things. And we touched upon it a little bit earlier. Um, and I think portfolio, as we were just speaking about, is maybe the first step. But what are your thoughts for or advice for people that are looking to, number one, distinguish themselves from their competitors to try to get into luxury real estate? And then number two, how do you attack the luxury real estate market and try to get those clients? It's a great question. Let's talk about the photography first, and we could talk about the business second, because I'm far more qualified to talk about the photography. You, you, your question was, how do you distinguish yourself? And to me, it's all about image quality. So how do you distinguish yourself? Shoot a little different. Shoot a little different. And I'm gonna, I'll challenge your listeners to think about the next time they go out on a shoot, um, bring a different lens or put on a slightly longer lens. I mean, most of, if you're shooting with a full frame mirrorless or DSLR, most people, and I know I have one when I have these kind of, you know, shoots that I need to get in and get out. I got a 16 to 35 zoom and you're at 16 most of the time banging out your room shots. Um, And they look great. Challenge yourself, take the 16 to 35 off. And I'm not sure what other lenses you have in your kit, but you want to be in the 35 to 50 millimeter focal length range. Challenge yourself. And what that does is you're now thinking about, back to what I said earlier, the most important elements in the room. So you're not shooting everything. And so now you're focusing in on vignettes that 
truthfully allow you to distinguish yourself from most people shooting, you know, run of the mill real estate photos. So that's my first suggestion. Change up your lens, shoot a little bit longer. I'm not saying put on a 70 to 200 and, sh and shoot ridiculous close ups. I, I'm just saying a little bit longer focal length, 35, 45 millimeter. Well, I'll tell you, Barry, you I bought used about a month ago, a 90 millimeter tilt shift, and I'm in love with it. I, I can't stop using it. I'm in love with it. <laughs> well, they have a yeah. 45 in the Canon and, and then they upgraded to a 50 now, right? Y yeah, so, but they also have a 90. Right, right. So I, bu I bought a secondhand 90 and maybe I'm in love with it because I guess it just, it's challenging me creatively, creatively, right. uh, my creativity to try to produce quality images with, you know, such a long focal length. I but, love some of those, those images. I've seen some of those images that I'm guessing you shot with your, with your 90. I mean, that really gets you tight. Yeah. Um, and now you're doing artistic things. Maybe but I, I can see an architect wanting those types of shots. My personal feeling is for somebody who's living with, living in front of their 16 millimeter lens all the time or 17 all the time that might be a very difficult transition to say oh my god what am i going to shoot with a 90 yeah, i think well, the my, 40 <laughs> my point was just to, just to exemplify what you're saying is you yeah. know do something that's a little out of your comfort zone as far as focal length for instance yes. and you'll learn to appreciate it love it how to have another tool in your arsenal to use when needed Mm -hmm. And um, it'll, you know, broaden your your horizons, I guess. If you want to, if that's let me let me ask you though, the Barry, uh, because we have a uh, a friend of the podcast, Larry Arnal in Canada. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but I'll the bottom line after. was, I don't want anybody to think out there that you need to to get what you're what you're saying, Barry. You don't need a tilt shift. You just, you know, you want to change your focal length. So please out yeah. there, if you're a real estate photographer, if you're getting into it, don't feel you need this, this uh, tilt shift to do these, these, this work because, Correct. I mean, some of the greats don't use tilt shift. Do you use a tilt shift there? Um, I use a tech camera, which is really um, even what slower. What the heck is that? Uh, I use a technical camera, which a is technical. Camera. Yeah. Well, I, I'm a phase one guy and I don't want to get off on a phase one. Yeah, conversation, please, but no. I'm a phase one shooter, which it's basically cost means, me too much. Yeah. Okay. I'm shooting with what effectively is a very shrunken down view camera. And that's really because of my background. That's what I love. I don't, I like the painstaking, yeah. um, deliberate nature of it. Um, and, but let's not talk about phase one. So yeah, the answer is yes, I am employing tilt shift if you will, uh, with my camera system, but I, but, but I don't think you have to. And I think my point is what I'm going to echo exactly what Rich just said. And that is you don't need to spend a fortune on lenses. It's more about how you're thinking. And so dif to differentiate oneself, you need to shoot a little different, um, slightly longer lens is going to help you. That's number one. Number two, interior designers love those long lens shots, not just because they put them on the cover of magazines, but because they're going to use them for their social media posts. And that longer lens is going to change how you think about the room. And I think it's going to open up, I hope, your portfolio to an interior design or a luxury real estate um, client. That's one. Two, lighting. I think a differentiator between 50 real estate photographers on the left side of the room and the other 50 on the right is how they employ their lighting. And if you've watched Rich's videos, um, or if you've seen some of my videos, because I'm dabbling in, in webinars these days. Thank you, Brian, for your technical help. Um, lighting is key. And it's not just you have a bunch of lights and you're lighting up the room, but you're being strategic with the minimalism with which you're lighting something. And so for me, I'm not the type of photographer that walks into a room and needs 28 layers to make it look good. Truthfully, I can make it look good, I hope. Five layers or less. How many layers do you need? Um, but it, it, my point is, is, is be strategic, be smart, and be creative with your light. Take a few chances. I think one of the things that I'm kind of, I'd like to think I'm known for in my work is and, and a designer used this, this um, expression years and years ago. He goes, your work has a sense of whimsy. And I think that was the best compliment because basically what that meant to me is there's a sense of humor there. 
or there's a sense of drama there. There's something whimsical just because. And I, I spoke with another photographer recently, and she was being somewhat critical of some of my work. She goes, I forgot the word. It wasn't whimsical. That wasn't her word. It was, um, well, uh, that word will come to me. She basically was like, why is that light there? You know, what's the motivation for it? Now, listen, I believe that lighting, su supplemental strobe lighting needs to be, or at least in one's mind, motivated, but it doesn't necessarily need to be feel literal. You can exaggerate that motivation in terms of direction of the light to create a sense of whimsy, drama, mood, atmosphere. These are the things that separate you to Brian's point. What's going to make you distinctive, different from every other photographer shooting a room? And so think about how you frame things, change up your focal length, um, and change up your lighting strategy a little bit. Try some different things. Watch some of Rich's videos. Go to my website and watch some of my videos, how I employ my strobe ambient blending. Um, and hopefully it inspires you to, to try something new. Um, and the last thing so in terms of It's very of interesting to say that. I'm going to interrupt you, go Barry, ahead. because I, I know both of your techniques, um, Barry, from watching your videos and Rich just from knowing you for so many years. And you both, you know both of you mix ambient and flash and you know i personally i do it on my real estate work i do more in line with what you do rich but most of my architectural and design work right now i'm using natural light but it's interesting to see how you both implore um mixing flash with ambient but you both have completely different techniques to do it so it's pretty pretty mm -hmm. cool stuff well i watch a lot of rich baum videos i'm being 100 percent honest <laughs> you, okay that. barry okay i'm gonna give you <laughs> money later no <laughs> you give me some money but i mean listen it's, it's funny i the, i got my first phase one camera my first digital capture system in 2003 and a, and a light bulb went off like a few months later it didn't happen immediately i was like oh wait a minute i can put lights in the shot and then mask them out and then all of a sudden i was like whoa and so that really and this is like photoshop version two i'm not sure, I'm, I'm not even sure if they had layers back then but once the whole thing once layers came in and then blend modes and mm. i mean it's become so almost too easy truthfully to, to create beautiful looks i guess i'm old school i still think there's no substitute for the purity of photographic tools to me most important photographic tool is the camera. Second most important photographic tool are your lights. And then third, very important, your digital darkroom, your darkroom work. Just ask Ansel Adams how important his darkroom work was to his, you know, his look. And so, yeah, all of us use these digital darkrooms slightly differently. But to me, it's still about shooting. And shooting to me what makes me is what makes me most excited as a photographer. Um, I don't want to say I'm impatient in front of my computer, but I would much rather spend two hours setting up a photo and 20 minutes in post <laughs> as Wouldn't opposed to all? the other way around. Oh, gosh. I mean, everything I, <clears throat> everything I do and learned, um, I learned indirectly from Scott Hargis just because, I mean, it really came from shooting. Everything I do came from trying to get it in camera and having multiple lights. That's why I don't mm -hmm. go for the single light moving it around and just doing composites. But I do need to composite, and I did realize that adding ambient light and ambient exposure helps me because I'm, for one, I'm not a good enough photographer, and I don't have the time. I might, have the time. might be able, with the right amount of time, I might be able to sculpt the perfect image, but it would take three hours. So... That doesn't work for real estate photography. So I just found that using ambient and being able to bring in the attributes of ambient, the attributes of lighting and ambient, really uh, make it. And and Brian, you're you're doing some big shoots right now with Gucci and 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 uh, and Rolex, and I think a lot of that. And I want to just say one thing to you, Barry. A lot of what you're doing, please don't people out there don't look at you know. Go look at Barry Grossman's website and his portfolio, but don't think that you can get those same images because forget lighting, technical, this and that. Barry, you're shooting some incredible 
uh, properties, incredible situations with incredible lighting that's built in that is yeah. forethought. I mean, real estate rarely has forethought of of great lighting that is just, you could shoot ambient if it had everything for you. But I just want people to know that don't feel bad if you're not getting these same images. There are a lot of great photographers and they're getting these things because a lot of that is the architecture. It's the model that they're shooting. The model is beautiful. Yeah. But anyway, I just want to uh, say that. Well, you're right. I, I knew a wonderful lifestyle photographer back in the day. I'll mention his name, Gary Kufner, K-U-F-N-E-R. Amazing lifestyle photographer. He was killing it in South Florida for years. He's probably retired by now. If he isn't, hey, Gary. Um, and he once said to me, it's all about the talent, meaning the models. As, as I was looking through his, his chromes on the light box with my loop, I was like, God, these look so good. How, how does he make them look so natural? You know, how, how is he doing this? And of course, there was some technique there. There was the right lens choice. There was the right quality of light but it's what's in front of the camera. So uh, listen, we're not always gonna be shooting the Taj Mahal. That's always my go-to euphemism for a pretty house or a pretty place or a dynamic interior. We're not, we're not always gonna have that five-star subject matter. Um, however, I'll say this, I've seen some pretty uninspired, not to be critical, and I never like to impugn other photographers' work. That's not what I do. I like to make people better and make myself better, but you can have some pretty uninspired work in an, in an inspired or inspiring interior. So you can go the wrong way. Conversely, when you're in a mundane interior, when you're in a, a, a run of the mill home, let's say, do your, you, you can, and I said this to one of my designers, you know, a few months ago, um, and we were chatting, we laughed about it. I want to put his work on a pedestal. It's like putting it on a stage. You can make, you know, um, something that's not that attractive feel special if you if you treat it as such with your camera, if you treat it as such with how you light it and, and compose your pictures. But yeah, it's an uphill battle when you're shooting things that aren't $10 million homes. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. But to get there, to go back to Brian's question, you know, how do you get there? How do you get there? How do you get out of the $500,000 home to the million? How do you get out of the million to the 3 million? Um, I think you need to separate yourself. It's hard. And it's, it's, it's become, and you guys probably know this as well, maybe more than I, very competitive out there in the real estate photography world. There's a lot of um, quality shooters and people that are doing nice work. Um, and if you really want to separate yourself, you need to have that extra something special. Think about how you frame things. Um, think about how you style things. Spend a little extra time if you can. And this is I see I see this as really the first and most important thing is subject matter. Um, it's like having a beautiful model and she's only got lipstick on half of her face, or she's only got one eye made up. No, go and make sure those pillows are right. Go and make sure the lampshades are straight. Go and make sure the window treatments are hanging right. All that very mundane stuff that will turn a real estate picture and not a very good one into an elevated one. And I see it even in interiors photographers, simple things. The height of the camera is not great. You're shooting down on the furniture. You're making it feel dwarfed and not scaled. You know, you're shooting with two wide angle of lens in a room that, is starting to feel a little, I hate to use the D word, distorted because you have something really close to the camera and it's a sofa and it's huge and the table or the wall unit or the view in the background is starting to feel too minimized. You know, look for those things as a photographer to help separate mediocre work from exceptional work, even if you're in a quote, mediocre environment. I think it's, it's, it's doable, admittedly harder to, 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 when you're shooting stuff that you maybe you're not that proud of. But if you can, and it's hard to carve out time, I realize, um, find the time in a shoot to get those special shots. Maybe you got to get 25, you know, cover your bases images. Try to get three or five that are special that you can put in your portfolio, that you can put on the interior design page on your website, that kind of thing. 
Well, stuff. Well, we're running low on time here, so we definitely appreciate you coming on, Barry. But um, I want to mention before we sign off, you have been doing some webinars over the last couple of months while we've all been at home, and I've watched my fair share of them. And they're actually great webinars because they don't really go into your technique of shooting, but the cool thing about them is they're all post-production webinars. But showing the layers and all that you can kind of see and learn your technique. And, you know, you and I have never had a discussion about how you shoot or your technique, but I know your technique, your shooting technique just from watching the webinars. So I want to implore you, you can, you can uh, plug your webinar site if you want sure, to sure. a little bit about the webinars. And I think you said you're going to be able to offer our listeners a, uh, a nice little discount. So whatever you want to say about the webinars. By absolutely. Now. Absolutely. Um, well, briefly about my, my webinars. First of all, about three years ago, the folks at Capture Integration and Phase One asked me to host a interior workshop. And they had asked me some years ago and it never happened. And flash forward to 2017, we made it happen. And I, it was one of the most kind of enriching, not monetarily, trust me, eye-opening, you know, I felt like I really grew as a person and as a photographer experiences, you know, to have 15 great photographers. I mean, some of these guys and gals that came were like, wow, these are really good people coming and they want to work with me. Um, it really was amazing. Flash to a year later, we did another one. We did another one of these workshops, which was a, maybe even more fun because we were shooting a couple of killer houses in Las Vegas and it was a fantastic experience. Um, we actually had our third workshop scheduled for May of this year and it is now, we're now in discussion. I don't have an exact date at this moment, but it looks like September, October, we're going to be doing our third workshop. You know, it's an amazing experience, not just because I'm there. It's an amazing experience, but because Capture Integration, who are a fantastic camera reseller, by the way, and they dust, they sell every, all the high-end beautiful stuff, but they sell everything else. It's not just phase one equipment, you guys. They have all beautiful lighting, cameras. They're, they're dealers for all the good stuff that you guys might want. And I have their support. And phase one comes, and they're bringing like five systems. So if you want to get your hands on and shoot with these, you know, Lamborghini meets Ferrari meets a Tesla meets a rocket ship cameras, this is a wonderful opportunity to shoot with this stuff. And let me tell you, I, I, was, I was a hard sell. And like most photographers, I needed to shoot with it before I was a believer um, in just how great it feels to shoot with this great gear. So it's a wonderful opportunity, these workshops to come out, work with me, work with this incredible equipment, and have great support from the Phase 1 folks. That said, when they canceled the <laughs> – canceled, postponed the, wor <laughs> the, the, the workshop because of what's been happening – I had several people reach out to me and like, oh, it's okay. We should do something online. Have you ever thought of hosting something? And the truth is, no, I hadn't thought of hosting something. But um, thanks to Brian's help, I was able to put together, and a lot of, trust me, a lot of long nights figuring out how to do this, uh, put together a, a photo tutorials website, phototutorials.net to be precise. And so we hosted 12 and at the very beginning, I was very gung-ho. I did three a week for the first two weeks. <laughs> um, and then subsequent weeks, we did two a week. We also hosted um, several, and these were for free, of course. Um, and we had some great attendance for these. Uh, portfolio reviews of sorts. And I had people send me sample images. And it became a really cool kind of casual night. And we went through maybe 28, 35, whatever the number was, images that people would send in. And I would scour over these images and offer my thoughts and on everything, pixel by pixel, basically. And truthfully, I think that's one of the greatest learning experiences I personally can offer. As successful as these webinars were and, and watching you know, guys like Rich and, 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 and myself doing my post and talking about my workflow and kind of talking about my, my concepts in terms of what makes great photography. I honestly think a great learning experience is listening to another photographer's feedback, hopefully somebody you respect, about what you're doing. And so we, I'm probably going to be doing another uh, free uh, uh, portfolio review, if you will, coming up. I try to do one a month. And so we have one coming up maybe in another couple of weeks. So I would suggest your listeners try to reach out to me and, and, and you can do that through phototutorials.net 
and I'll post when we're going to have our next photo critique. But um, it's a really, 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 really good learning experience, and it is for free. Um, in terms of the, the, the workshops that I've, excuse me, the webinars that I've hosted, I try to cover the base, the full gamut of my portfolio. So I have several on resort photography because I shoot resort and hotel brands. I have several shooting commercial interiors for, for certain architectural firms. And commercial interiors for me means, you know, lobbies of, of office buildings, workspace interiors. I'm not sure how many of your listeners get to shoot that kind of stuff. I shot, I had one dedicated to what I call mixed use interior. So these are like spaces that could feel like a restaurant interior. It could be an office. It's a combination of both. These mixed use interiors are popping up everywhere. I'm not sure if you shoot any of these um, multifamily type mid rises, you go into the lobby and it feels like, oh, you're almost like in a hotel environment. And then you walk 50 feet into the back and you have a meet and greet area that has a conference table. And so my mixed use wet, wet webinar focused on those types of shots uh, that we get. I had another one that focused on condo shooting. So again, shooting the public spaces, shooting the apartment, shooting the lobby, those kinds of things. And then of course, they're high end residential, the luxury real estate, as you call it, Brian. I have several of, of those because that's really what I do most of. That's what most of us shoot predominantly, our homes. So yeah, I mean, I'll wrap up by saying that absolutely go to phototutorials.net. Um, I'm going to be, I'm not sure when this is going to, to uh, be airing. When did you say it was going to be airing? A couple of weeks. In a couple of weeks. Yeah. And we, you and I chatted, Brian, about um, a discount code. What was the one that you recommended? I would say make a shooting spaces. Why not make absolutely. it as easy as possible? <laughs> yeah. I mean, because I owe so much to, to Brian and Rich tonight. Um, I'll have a shooting spaces a uh, discount, probably 10% off of anything that you buy. And the truth is most of the stuff that's up there right now is already discounted. And that's, and uh, people have been requesting, Hey, can we group them? Can you create bundles? Can you create collections? And so I basically have created several different types of ways to look at the webinars. Um, and I am going to be hosting a, well, by the time this gets put on the air, it'll, it'll be in the past, but I'm always doing my best to do free webinars as well, because listen, we're all photographers. Um, and I try to understand that I'm part of this community. I'm not any different than any one of us. I'm out there grinding still to this day after 30 years to try to improve my work, to try to shoot better work than I did yesterday, tomorrow, and also be respectful of the people that kind of are coming. And what I know you guys have a, a bigger, probably a much bigger audience through your webinars and, uh, and and how many people listen to this podcast uh, a couple thousand a week. that's amazing yeah that's amazing well um yeah you can hit me up you can email me and check out phototutorials.net to see when we have anything scheduled coming up but the good news is again thanks to brian he's taught me how to record all of my webinars <laughs> and all of those 12 webinars which are very detailed um and set up in chapters the way that Brian suggested. Maybe we'll uh, set up something in our pipeline to do a webinar with you on luxury real estate. Hopefully that'd be brilliant. Yeah. That'd be brilliant. I think Fantastic. it would be exciting. And uh, I would love to see any one of your listeners or you guys come to the workshop. I don't have the dates yet, but we're talking like September, October. And this one is going to be hosted in a pretty cool, um, different uh, environment. That's all I'll say. It's on the outskirts of Atlanta. So it's kind of, I call this modern country is how I would define it. So it's not a $15 million home overlooking Vegas, which is amazing. And we had a ball shooting, but that's not what most of us get to shoot every day, is it? So what's cool about this workshop is the homes are going to be grand. They're going to be beautiful, but they're going to be more to scale to what I think most of us truthfully are shooting. So it's actually going to be a great opportunity to not only get to shoot with some of this great gear, but to see, you know, my strategies to get your hands on the camera and we can work together in, in a more kind of, you know, approachable interior, if you will, and exteriors too, because we're going to get exteriors as well. Great. Great. Wow. Wow. Incredible. Some great information there. And uh, I can't wait to check out your, uh, your webinars. Thank you, Rich. Yes, I want to see those. So I just want to say thank you so much, Barry. I want to thank also our last sponsor, iGuide. 
And uh, I got is a turnkey solution for those looking to expand the real estate photography business beyond photography to add 3D tours, laser accurate room measurements, square footage calculators, and professionally drafted floor plans. Our listeners can get their first five free eye guides by adding the code shooting spaces in the referral section at purchase. So just go visit goeyeguide.com to learn more. Yeah, thank you. Great. So, Barry, thank you for, for coming on. And it's been uh, great chatting with you tonight. Great chatting with you and uh, becoming friends with you over the last couple of weeks. Um, and, you know, I'm gonna, we're going to look seriously into maybe putting a webinar on together in the next couple of months once yeah, I guess, I'd love it. things I'd come love back it. to normal. And, yeah. you know, I'm sure anybody that looks at your website or sees your work would love to learn some of your techniques and how to do what you do. So, cool. Thank thanks you. For, right. Thanks for your time tonight. We appreciate mm-hmm. it. And, uh, Hopefully you're in South Florida. You'll get back to the swing of things soon and you'll be. uh, Yes. Yes, absolutely. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Really sincerely. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. We also want to remind all our listeners to submit some ask the guys questions. We're always looking for some ask the guys. We can never use um, too many of those. So if you have some ask the guys questions, please use that little widget on our website and ask us whatever you like. And Rich and I will do our best to answer it. Or if we cannot, we will find a guest that can. If you have questions on luxury real estate, ask us and maybe we'll bring Barry back. So um, Absolutely. Cool. And uh, I think that wraps it up, Rich. Yeah. Yeah. I want to say, please, if you're not subscribed, please do so to uh, shootingspacespodcast.com. Check out all our webinars and our presets, all this stuff. T-shirts. We got great T-shirts. Nobody gets T-shirts. Everybody go out and get a T-shirt. But we have that at shootingspaces.net. And uh, I just want to thank Barry Grossman. Thank you, Brian. And everybody, go out there and shoot some spaces. This has been Shooting Spaces. For more episodes, visit shootingspacespodcast.com and visit our education site at shootingspaces.net.